Okay. Start. Well, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Ali. Most of you guys probably have sent me through emails back and forth with regard to setting your account. Welcome to RNA sequencing using high performance computing workshop. We are going to have two sessions. Today we are going to talk about some preliminaries about what uh, a, a high performance computing is, what you need to know to communicate to your machine, and then uh, how you actually submit a job for a calculation to your machine. That part will be uh, presented by Eric. Then uh, next day, um, Stuart and Adriana are going to tell you all about how the data for RNA sequencing are produced. So Adriana is going to tell you, going to tell you about um, how a sequencer produces data. And then Stuart will go through the um, process of analyzing those data. So um, a high performance computing by default is a very, uh, has a very nice definition over there, um, but practically it means an aggregation of several desktop that would configure them in a sense that they all perform one task consecutively. So if you manage to do that, it means that all of those processors, all of those memories at one time will be busy with one task, they perform the job, and the outcome will be come out, sorted out, and presented to you at the time of review. If you can do that, you already have a high performance computer. We happen to have one of them already ready. It is, uh, as I said, an aggregation of nodes. One of the nodes usually acts as head node. A head node is the node that you guys log into it, and you ask for requests a command for a task to be performed, that command was passed by head will be redistributed back to the computer. So this pretty much means that we don't do calculation on a head node. All of the calculations will be scheduled, and it will tell you more about it, and will be distributed back to um, redistributed back to the compute node. This is very important because you are not supposed to perform anything on head node. Head node is specified to perform maintenance and monitoring of the system. And if we um, submit jobs over there, the uh, cluster is going to be initially responsive and there will be a lot of problems uh, later on. And the details of it are going to be said to you. We are happening, we happen to have a cluster named Phoenix. You already have heard the name has a head node, of course. The head node has four, uh, 32 cores and 128 um, random, ac random access memory, gigabyte of random access memory. And then 70 compute nodes that all of them at least include 32 cores and 128 gigabyte of RAM. We have several specific nodes which uh, can perform some particular calculations, but for now, you guys don't really need to um, um, get busy with that part. So, now that we are here and we all are configured, let's log in. Open your laptop and log in. When you are logging into your laptop, what you do, you pretty much SSH, in our case, of course, would be demo. And in your case, you will be asked for a passphrase. You will enter the passphrase and you will log in to the machine. As you see, the outcome is a prompt line including the username, which is your Kerberos ID, and the name of the server that you are at, which is Phoenix. So, Usually this is the process of doing it. Remember, some of you guys could not log in, so I would ask you to perform some more um, um, 
some more procedure to do that, but this is how you do it. If you are using a terminal, if you are using a uh, PuDi, you of course by now supposedly configured how to um, create a key and you save the key. So you um, choose the server that you have saved your key and the name, and the name or configuration and the name. You load it and then you open it. And of course you are on again to the to a window which looks like the other one. That one I believe has a black background on either green or white fonts. So what you did was pretty much a communication between your client and server. This communication has several parameters, including the SSH key that you created and sent us, and the password. This process means that you, who have the passwords and you are not going to share it with anybody, are using that particular machine, that particular laptop or desktop, to log into the machine. Remember, Phoenix has some uh, PHP data or connected to some PHP data, so do not share your password with anybody. We do not uh, want to um, have anybody comprised with your um, account. Then, afterwards, you are on the machine, you are start working, you are doing your tabulation, you perform whatever you need to perform. By the end of it, always, Log out. Logging out would do a very nice and finalized bookkeeping of what you have done and the processes that has been done. And so you want all of them to be finalized and to be recorded properly because if there is a problem, you can actually figure it out afterwards. So always log out. Do not close that window. You know that there is a crossover out there and you like it is kind of kills the process instead of Ending, it kills it. So not everything will be actually um, recorded by the end of it. So Linux is an operating system like Windows or Mac. You are familiar with Windows or Mac. These are the uh, aggregation of software, you may say, that they control your machine or you can communicate with your machine. Another one which is a bit more popular in there is a the slide of the well, the main difference that you usually see is the how you communicate with your uh, laptop or desktop using either Linux or uh, a Windows. And in Windows, we use something which is called graphical user interface. This is why you use your mouse, you move it around, you right click, you choose something, for instance, new folder. You click on it, a folder comes up. Here on Linux, instead of that, you're going to use a, a command line interface with the machine. Instead of right and click and mouse, you're going to type some commands. So a command has several parts. It is something that you type in, and the name of the command or the actual part of the command that performs the action that you're looking for, it has some options or switches. You're going to see some of them. Some of them are actually quite useful because it helps you to see and recognize or filter what you exactly need right away. And some arguments, some of the commands need arguments. When, for, for instance, previously on Windows, you say new folder. It immediately asks you what is the name. Over here, you say MKDIR. You need to tell it what the name of the directory is. If you don't tell it, it doesn't know what to do. So some commands take arguments. So we are going to see in our um, um, our uh, task today which commands we are going to use and which which of them which of them are actually helpful. So now that you are there, let's start our first command and type PWD. PWD stands for Path of Working Directory. If you issue that command and say um, and enter, you see a line which is if home demo. If home demo is pretty much says where in the file structure of the system you are located. 
you are located on ifs, which is our storage um, on server. Home, which is one of the directories that user usually reside there. And your server side. You all issued one command, you will get your own server side over there. So it's home server side is where you reside. This place is read only what I think I say to say that this is one of the only places that you are allowed to create, delete, and uh, perform your um, calculation. There are some other directories for some other um, calculations that we can allow you to get in and you do your calculation. So this is where you have all the permission to do whatever you want. Well, now that we are here and we are in your own directories, let's try another command. ls list. If you list the content of your directory, you see what is in it. The contents could be files or directories. In here, as you are seeing, there are four different directories with different names. If your account has been created like in the last couple of days, you uh, presumably don't have anything in it. So when you uh, say ls, it doesn't return anything. Most of the time, when you perform a command, if it, if it runs and it um, performs what it needs to do, you usually don't have much of an output. You are going to see it. The good thing about command line interface or CLI is when you issue some a command and you are not doing it right for some reason, like the, um, there is a, for instance, um, well, it, it doesn't, it cannot run, it gives you a message. And it, that message is very important because it tells you what is wrong. And furthermore, if there is something a bit more complicated than that, we are always asking users to send us that error message. And when I tell you send me that error message, I don't say that it's a flag. I drive to see the command that you issued and the error to the very end of it. That actually gives us some tips how to um, uh, troubleshoot what you are facing. So, we happen to see um, the content of your directory, which is ls. So, if you happen, uh, well, I, I told you about the options and switches. How would you know what options or switches are available to you? We are going to use another command called man, M-A-N, which stands for manual, for ls. If you type this one, you would see something which comes like that and it's quite a long list of uh, lots of things. One of them is dash A and dash A and um, uh, all um, other stuff that you may see. Also, manual would explain to you how that command is supposed to be issued and what options are available and if it takes any argument, how it does that. For instance, you have something like dash A also, there should be something like dash L. If, yes? So, it's asking what manual do I want? So, you are supposedly in this uh, manual page. You need to get out of it, right? You read whatever you needed to know, so you need to get out of it. Press Q, and you're out of the manual page. If over here I say, okay, ls-a, as it was mentioned in the document, and push it, now we are going to see that the content of our directory was not only those four directories, but also a lot of other stuff. Most of them are hidden because you usually don't need to uh, mess with them or you don't need to edit them or whatnot. So you don't really need to be worried about that. So we learned about PWD is one of the very important um, commands because you always need to know where you are issuing that command. 
of the command are actually sensitive about the content of your data, so you need to know where you are issuing it and what it's going to do. Always double checking the path that you are at and the content of your directory should almost become your habit. You get into a directory, you ls or ls a. Of course, ls a is not that important. I can actually tell you something which probably would help you a bit more. ls l, which is another option, would list it with a long format. When you say ls l, it not only tells you about the directory available over there, it tells you where it has been modified, how large each of them are, who is the owner, and who is the group that can share the data on those directories. So ls l is one of the commands that uh, you can actually widely use to figure out what's going on in your own directory or wherever you are actually. So, we learn about PWD, we learn where we are at, we learn about um, LS or list, and we could learn about MN. So any command that I give you, as a practice, you do man PWD, for instance, and see what options are available to you. You can actually play around with it and see which one you feel more comfortable or which one actually gives you better information of what you are looking for. So uh, this is pretty much the file structure of your um, of your machine. We are not going to detail uh, to get more into the detail of it. Mainly, you need to know that all you have here is 200 gigabytes of disk space, and you can do all of your calculation here. And you are going to you know, make directories here, organize your data in it, and perform your calculation in uh, those directories. So. Let's go back to our prompt. In our prompt, we realize that we have uh, some um, directories over here. There are some already uh, made. Let's make a directory because we need to um, figure out um, how to get into them. And well, we need to figure out a lot, but <laughs> that's for the practice. MKDIR would make a directory for you. This is one of the commands that you need an argument for. If I say mkdir and just push it, try and make mkdir dash dash help, because this means that you don't know what mkdir is. So you, it means that you really need to know how to use it. So mkdir, for instance, project one. Let's make it project one. If you look carefully, we already have project one. Assume that I don't, I didn't notice that. This is a good thing about command line interface in now in a very preliminary stage, but see, what it tells you, you cannot create directories, project one, file exists. So you know what has been wrong, and so you can actually fix it. Okay, I didn't want project one, I wanted project two. So you made a directory, you need to change to it project. So let's show um, those people who haven't been using online interface, they would um, feel that it's a bit uh, tiring typing all of these things. Now I'm gonna show you a magic. You just type proj and then push tab. It fills it to the very end of the variation. If you push tab twice, it tells you which options you have. So instead of typing everything, which actually is gonna happen later on in, um, in your um, next session tomorrow, you're gonna to type a long path, but knowing this magic, you can actually push, 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 push. So it all the way to the very end of it. So I'm going to use project two, and go there. Okay, where am I? I am on the IFS home demo project too. Where is it? Nothing. Well, very well. Now, let's uh, see what is actually here. Remember I told you about ls-a? I can actually combine it with another option, L. 
I don't need to say dash A dash L. I can say, okay, everything in a long format, show me what it is. In spite of the fact that when you type LS, there was nothing there. When you say LS dash AL, long list of everything, it tells you that there are actually two directories here. One of them is dot, the other one is dot dot. Dot means this very directory that you are at. So it gives you some information about the directory that is right where you are. This is kind of helpful later on when we are talking about um, uh, if it's using a command or um, things like that. Dot dot means the current directory. So if I am here, if I say cd dot, where am I? I am where I was. And if I say cd dot dot, I go to my parent directory. This is the proof. So cd dot and cd dot dot, um, dot and dot dot are two of those um, things that points that you need to know. Two points that you need to know. There is another thing is called tilde. If I go to project two, for instance, or I make some nested directory and I go all the way down to my different projects, but I want to go back to my own home directory, you just say cd. It's this. Uh, Till this um, the character should be uh, visible to you, it sends you directly back to your home directory. Like if you are in a project one, I don't know, test one, test two, blah, 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 and you just type cd um, till, it gets you all the way back to your home directory. Another useful command to use. Then, since we are here and we are in project two, and we actually figure out that there is nothing. There is nothing in it. Let's make something in it. In Windows, you use Microsoft, um, Microsoft Office to create files, to edit it, to write something in it. Over here, for now, we are going to use an editor, which is one of the simplest editors uh, that people use, called Nano. If you type Nano and push the Enter, a page is going to open for you, and the cursor is always ready for you to type something. So we are going to type something. If you type something, for instance, say, hello world, the very classic uh, example of it, you already have it typed. Now you can use any of these options to change it, modify it, or write it. Control O writes out, like saves whatever you wrote right there. So let's Control O. It is going to ask you, okay, if you want to write it, what would be the name of the file? You may say script dot bash. Immediately. Top there, you see the file the script of bash appears, and this is the content of this. Sorry, but you control what? Control O writes it, and control and control O writes it. Like this. The good thing is that all of your options are available here. Like if you if you do practice different options here, you can see actually those option changes, so you can go back and forth about what you need to do. Okay, after you are done. You can control X to exit. Control X exits from the um, editor. So we made a file called script.bash. Inside it, there is hello world. You may forget what was in it. So let's use another command called cat. Cat script. I'm going to use the tab compilation. Bash. Is going to tell you what, it, what is in it. Chat is very important um, tool because of one very 
we have difficulties at the system. You saw that I opened an editor and I had something in it, and of course I came out. This means that in that file, there is nothing but hello world exclamation mark. As a practice that I take, <laughs> you can go and find a editor like Microsoft. Copy a text from there and try to paste it using one of those options down there if actually allows you to paste. Paste it over here and then come out and then do chat dash A, one of the options, the features of chat is dash A. Chat dash A, that file, you see a lot of characters which are hidden characters you don't see hidden in your editor here and there. What this, what it, why is it important? Because you sometimes may accidentally copy it from somewhere, the text or the script that you want, put it somewhere uh, to, in an in a editor, save it, come out, start running it, and it gives you weird <coughs> error messages. The error messages that, that do not even mean much, or it's not even correct, which is a problem that you want. This means that those characters are missing out. The way that the machine is understanding those characters. So this is why we always recommend that you guys use an editor such as Nano or better one, Emacs is the one that, uh, or um, yeah, Emacs if you are, uh, have a manual about it available for editing a file. That was one line file. You may happen to have a file which are long and several pages. Instead of uh, cat, you may use more. Well, more is better actually. More script tab compilation. It tells you the content of it. The good thing about more is that you can actually browse up and down. The cat will tell you only what actually is confined in one uh, screen. But the, in the more, if there is several pages, you can go back and forth or up and down it. So we learned about cat, we learned about more, and we learned about uh, this uh, comma. Let's see where we are. Yes, okay. So let's go back. First and foremost, where are we again? We are in the ifs home demo. I wanted to make that bash script.bash actually in the project too. I made it in my home directory. Wrong decision. What we need to do is moving it from wherever it is into, into there. For moving, you use a command called move. mv script bash. So, move is one of the commands that needs two arguments. One of them is the um, Thank you, source. <laughs> the source and the final one is destination. What do you want to move? You want to move something from somewhere to somewhere else. So I already told it that I want to use the script bash, which is located in the directory that I am right now. And I want to put it on the project two with the same name, you may say. or even different name. It takes any option, you can rename it, or you can use the same name. If I type that, and I can actually say, okay, let me go there, cd2 project2, let's see what, what is here. The script to bash that I had there, now is there. The proof is that if I go back and ls-l, script two is not here anymore. I send it to, uh, and the script um, is not here anymore. It's, I sent it over to project. So, you got your um, directory, there is something in it. You made a mistake, you don't need the directory anymore. There is a command called remove directory, which is actually R-M-D-I-R, in opposed to make-D-I-R, 
um, make directory which was mkdir. You have removed directory. Okay, I don't want project two anymore. If I do that, it says I can't remove it. It's reminding you that there is something in the directory. So it doesn't allow you to do something that you are not really 100% sure about. For removing project two, first I need to delete that file. To, to do that, I can actually use rm, remove. I can say remove project to script bash. Are you sure about it? I'm assuming that you guys are just like typing things right now. You're, you're practicing, right? Of course, you are. You are. You would say, yes, I want to remove it. It is going to remove it for you. The reason is that if you go there, actually the reason is even better. Now if you say remove project 2, it, without any message, we are saying that it's uh, um, everything is actually zero, it actually removed that directory. So it's not removed. So we learn about remove and remove directory. If you look at the manual for RM, you see a lots of options there are there, including force, including blah, blah, blah. You need to make sure how you are actually using remove. Remove is one of the most common that you don't want to mess with too often unless you know this what you're doing. So let's make sure we know how we are doing it. And the only thing that over here is the options called R or recursive. By the way, each option or each switch has two forms, a short form and a long form. You can either use rm-r or rm-recursive. This, this rm-recursive means that whatever is in that directory also, we, you know, I want it to remove. So we are going to be very careful about these commands because this is going to remove everything else. And there's another option that if you apply that one, it's not going to ask you which you like it or not. So we are not going to talk about that option. So let's go back. We learn about remove and uh, RMDIR. Uh, now let's um, let's make another project. MKDIR project three would be better. I'm going to do something now. Okay. Where am I? I am on my home directory. I'm going to I'm going to make a file on project three. I don't really need to go there. I can say from right here, I say nano project three, and even I can give it the name of a file. I would say, you know what? Script two or script dot bash, the same name. It opens it. Okay, what do you want in it? You want a file to be created in that directory. How do you want to um, have it? Okay, you say, this time, I want the whole world to know that I'm saying hi to them. As before, control O is going to write it out. Look what happens. When you say you want to write it out, it gives you the whole path that you can daily with it. You say you want to write it in this very place, right? This is an option if you want to change the name, then change it right now. Or you keep up with your decision and stay with the same name and say yes. So control X is going to write, oh, I'm sorry. Um, is going to write it, and then Control X would get you out. Now, if you CD to Project Three, I can see even if that script is there. I just do script 
tab compilation, and tab compilation tells me that this file is already there. You can perform the ls right here. List what is in that directory for me, or list if this exists. <coughs> This brings up a um, point of absolute versus relative path. First of all, let's make sure that this exists. Yes, this exists. So you, you know that the file that you created actually exists. Remember we said if you type pwd, If you type PWD, you actually would get the full path. This is the absolute path starting with slash. It tells you exactly where things are located as you're going along. Where am I? Where I am here? I'm actually in the demo. So, if I CD to um, project three, means that I actually want to go from its home demo project three. You can perform a lot of uh, um, a lot of commands from where you are or writing on your script. But you I personally rather to always make sure that my path is correct. Most of the problem that you may face is from the fact that the full path is either not there or it's not defined. Let me present a little bit, a bit more about it. So let's make sure that when we are actually talking about the content of a directory, we are, content, we are talking about the content of the directory that you are at right now, or we are, con we are talking about the content of directory which comes from the, all of these backslashes that go somewhere else. It very, it very much may happen that we get directories with a similar name, or have a similar name. So we really need to make sure where we are actually uh, at. Okay, we are here, so uh, an ls, of course, tells me the content of uh, directory. So we talked about that, and we, okay. You have a script, you wrote something in it, you need a copy because you need some modification because you need it to do something else to it. I can copy with the command cp a script bash into another let's see what is in it it's the same thing that we talked about before so Remember we said that we are gonna actually everybody in the whole world know about hello world? Echo is a command that actually performs or echoes back whatever you give it. It doesn't necessarily need the code to have. I personally like it because there are some slash and backslash characters that mean something different when you quote them. It just means whatever is in the code, tell me. If you say echo, Hello world. Well, <laughs> probably because chat doesn't. <laughs> what did I do? Mm -hmm. Oh, exclamation mark. Yeah. yeah probably, yeah. Let's do this. So. Let's don't go so fancy and make sure that hello world, everybody is here right now. So you actually run a command from your command line. What you are going to do by tomorrow afternoon would be making a script as you are doing here, but actually issue a command and ask it to do something. By now, this file has nothing but some text in it. In order to do that, you need to tell the machine that this file is not a text file. 
There is something in it I want you to perform. I want you to execute that. How do we do it? Let's. Oh, sorry. Let's uh, look at the script. The, 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 there, are, there are particular special characters that you are going to use to tell the machine that this is going to be an executing or executable file. That is the line. So you say, okay, echo hello world. Control out, control X, so now you have a file that in it you know that there is something that can be executed, but you first need to tell the machine that this is the executable file too, like before the machine gets into it and starts to uh, running those commands, it needs to know the permission on this file. The permission of this file for now, and we, we promise not to talk too much about it, but it's only writing and reading. Read and write. I'm going to change it, change the mode, change the modification in the mod <coughs> by using the command chmod. I want it to be executable. Script bash. I want to be executable. Now if I do the same thing, this time instead of typing the whole thing, let me show you another trick, which is the arrow up and arrow down. If I keep pushing the arrow up, all of the commands that I have used before are going to show up. So instead of typing them, you just use the arrow up and arrow down and get whatever you uh, wanted to perform. If I do it again, now it has an X in front of it. it, means that this file now it is executed. So now let's execute it. We are going to say script bash. Hello world. <coughs> this is what you are going to do in the next couple of hours, one hour, and tomorrow. You are going to make a script that actually going from head mode to function mode, calculate the distribution of each amino acid in your body. Good luck with that. <laughs> well, I think I am almost done with what I wanted to cover now. Oh, SCP. Uh -huh. yep. Okay, this is the part that probably um, I actually sent out an email asking you to Make sure that if you, if you want to use the graphical user interface, you have it for file transfer. If not, you are going to talk about it. Again, it will happen a lot that you have a file on Linux and you want, it, you want to drag it into your local machine, or you have it on your local machine and you want to send it out to Linux to online. In order to do that, we are using a command called SCP. So, let's for instance um, open another tab. Here, let me get a new tab and I look here and let's see what I have here. I have movies, pictures, and lots of other stuff. If I go to documents, do I have documents? Yes. Let's see what is in it. I have there is something like config. Configs FA, probably it's so large I'm not going to do that. But like Glimmer text is one of the files that I like to send over. I'm going to say S copy Glimmer text and then the name of the server. I'm going to say demo at phoenix dot med dot nyu dot edu semicolon if I perform this right now it's going to put this file exactly into my home directory 
but I don't want it my directory. I want it to actually be on project two. So I'm going to send it to project two with the same name dash dot. Some people say that you don't really need to say dot, but if I don't say dot. Uh, again, it would do the same, but if I say dot, and um, it's going to actually put it exactly with the same name, Glimmer text. No such a file or directory, probably a project, I had it project three. There we are. It was project three, not project two. Well, if I go back to that and go to the project three and ls dash l, Glimmer text is from your local machine sent over to the base. You can do the same thing with the other way around. Like you can say, as copy, for instance, bash dot, uh, script dot bash, uh, I'm sorry, um, demo at uh, phoenix dot med dot uh, slash, uh, I'm sorry, project three slash Glimmer into my local machine, you just put a dot over there, or you can use the path and say where, where you want it to be. And just issue it, and it's going to send it from wherever you are, back to uh, your directory or vice versa. Does it make a copy to put it in? It is making a copy. It's S, S secure copy. Okay. Um, any, any command has some correlation between the name and what is that? So copy actually. Um, copy doesn't doesn't move it. By, by the end of it, you are going to still have your local, um, your destination, your source file is still there. Okay. And is there a command where you would copy it over and change the name as well? So that's the exactly. Direction. I could do. Let's do it right now. I could say, okay, instead of that, oops, sorry. Let's go back here. I say I don't want the name to be the same. I want the same the name to be, for instance. Glimmer two dot text. It's gonna send it as Glimmer two. Well, um, how many people over here are using Windows laptop? So for Windows laptop, Lauren is gonna tell you and cover you relatively quick um, description of how to do that. Those people with Windows laptop, have you happened to configure Windows? So you're actually already there. Everybody, who else has this? You, you have it. So we have one person, right? Has Windows machine and uh, maybe it's only one person. Yes, maybe maybe, maybe we talk about it after the class. We can actually during the break. We can actually go through it and configure uh, it. Okay. So. Mm. <coughs> I think that's all. Well, Okay, while, while I'm getting set up, um, we have a little bit of a pause. So if you've been having any difficulty uh, following along with LE, uh, this would be an excellent time to raise your hand. And actually, you can also do that at any time while I do the next phase, okay? Because we do have a few grad students embedded among the room who will help you out. Um, so don't be shy.
Okay, hello everyone. Uh, I'm Eric. I, I run the High Performance Computing Facility with the Center for Health Informatics and Bioinformatics, Chibi. And that is the High Performance Computing Facility that we have been using, the cluster that Ali mentioned in the beginning. That's us. Uh, so I'm Eric Beskin. Hello. Now, uh, what Ali taught you in the first half, he showed you, he, basically he was showing you the very basics of using Linux itself and using the command line. And he was showing you how to run certain commands that are built in to just about any Linux environment. What I'm going to start talking about now is stuff that's more specific to our cluster. And also, I'm going to show you how to get at commands that are not otherwise built in. Okay, so suppose you're trying to use more like an application program. Application programs like Stuart is going to tell you about tomorrow that won't be on your path by default. Uh, for that, we use a system called environment modules. So the reason for envir environment modules, uh, there are a few reasons. Uh, some programs need a lot of setup of the environment to work properly. Also, we have multiple versions of the same application installed in many cases. So those two versions may need different setup. They may conflict with each other. We want to be able to keep those versions installed side by side and let different users or different programs use different versions at different times. Okay. So we have this system called environment modules, which lets us do that. You can have multiple versions of the same software installed and it keeps track of which version you want to use, any prerequisite software needed for that version, and make sure that you don't have conflicting software set up on the system. So <clears throat> I'll sh briefly show you some commands that are useful for environment modules, and then I will also start uh, the interactive part on the terminal, and uh, you can try to follow along with that. Um, so the command that does everything with modules is the module command. Module avail is useful because you can see all the programs that we have um, modules for on our system on the Chibi HPC cluster. So for example, if I say module avail, you'll see that these are the programs for which we have modules installed on the cluster. It comes in a few sections. The last section is really the user facing application programs and you'll see that we have quite a lot of them. These are mostly bioinformatics programs installed. You'll also see that for some programs we have multiple versions. I'm just looking at the first one up here, Abyss. We have three versions of that program. Uh, whoops. Okay. Module list shows you what modules you have available it, what, sorry, what modules you have loaded right now in your environment. And you'll see an example of using that. How you load and unload a module to add or subtract that from your environment is module load and module unload. You can get help on a specific module by saying module help the name of that module. Often there are useful tidbits that we've put in there about using that particular program on our particular system. So saying module help followed by the name of the module can be useful. Module show shows you the internals of that module, what the module is actually going to do to your environment if you load that module. Now man, the, the command man is one that Ali showed you in the first uh, half for, um, to get a manual page. You can say man module to see how to use the module command itself. Okay, so let's look at an example of loading modules and using them and how they work, which is to manage versions of software and conflicts between those versions. So right here, this is the main purpose of modules. Okay, so suppose, suppose I know that there is an interesting program called bed tools, and I'm wondering whether, and I've seen in the manual for bed tools that it has an option to tell you what version you're using. Bed tools minus minus version. And so suppose I'm curious, is that already available on this system without having to load anything in particular? So I could just try it. I could say bed tools minus minus version. Okay. 
and the shell comes back to you and says, I've never heard of bed pools. Okay, so you might think, I'm out of luck. Or you might think, I wonder whether the HPC guys have installed bed pools on this system. In fact, I wonder whether they have a module for it already. And if you're wondering that, you might say, module avail bed tools. So you can restrict the module avail to be looking for a particular screen, a, a particular module. I reduced the font size a little bit, by the way. Is this still legible in the back, reasonably? OK. So this shows you that, yes, we have bed tools available here. And furthermore, we have three different versions. And these are the versions that are available. Right. So seeing those versions, I could try to load one of those. I could say, yeah. Ah, right. OK, good question. So the question is, why didn't it tell us right then we have these modules available for you here? Um, so bed tools is the system has what's called a path, which is a list of directories where it looks for programs. If you type, if you type the name of a command, you're actually typing the name of a file, and it's looking for a file of that name. It has a standard list of places where it looks for commands. Since BedTools is an, is an application program, it's not like a built-in Unix command, it's not on that standard list. So the system's never even heard of BedTools before. And it just says, I haven't heard of it. But with modules, we can say, is there a module for this command? Yes, there is. I can say module load BedTools and slash the version. It's always the name of the module slash the version that I want to load, that tool slash 2.15.0, if that's the version I want. Now I could try the same command again. Ali pointed out that up arrow scrolls through your history of commands. So if I press up arrow a couple of times, or a few times, I get to bed tools minus minus version. I could also type it again. And I see that now bed tools response. And it says, I'm version 2.15.0. It's worth pointing out, by the way, that minus minus version is a particular option of bed tools. A lot of commands have that option, but not all do. So you would check the manual of whatever application you're trying to use to see whether, that that, whether that's an option for that particular um, command. OK. Now, suppose, whoops. Now suppose I say, well, that's all very well and good, but I really wanted 2.17.0. So I pressed up arrow a few times to get to module load bed tools, 2.17.0. I got an error message. Why did I get an error message even though 2.17.0 exists on this system? What it says is it conflicts with the currently loaded bed tools 2.15.0. Okay, those two versions conflict with each other. Modules keeps track of that for you, so it's not going to let you load a conf conflicting version. Okay, we can fix that. We can unload, case sensitive, lowercase, unload bed tools 2.15.0. Now I try the same load 2.17.0, and this time it completed without complaint because I got rid of the thing that was causing the conflict. Okay. Now I ask, does bed tools exist? And if so, what version is it? It's 2.17.0 now. So I have a, a different version of bed tools loaded up. Now, each of our modules, by convention on our system, we have each module define a variable that points to the installation directory for that software. Uh, Ali showed you the um, echo command. If I echo dollar sign and then in all caps bed tools underscore sorry bed tools underscore root, that shows me the full path, the absolute directory name. Ali showed you how you specify a location in the file system to the installation directory for that software. It's nice that such a variable is defined because you can see what's there with our friend the ls command. You can say ls bed tools root, and you can see that this software comes with the following directories in the distribution. 
That's useful because, for example, we see that it comes with a data directory. And so it comes with sample data. It might be interesting to know what's there. So I could ls bed tools root slash data. And I can see that it came with a couple of example bed files. Um, this variable is also useful because sometimes the manual of the program might tell you, look in the data directory, subdirectory of the distribution, the installation directory. Well, you don't necessarily know where the installation directory is, so you can use the variable. And that is our first run with modules. I'm going to unload bed tools, clean up my environment. So we've seen how it manages versions of software. We've seen how it manages conflicts between different versions of the same software. Occasionally, one module will also conflict with an entirely different module, um, not just different versions of the same module. Now, another nice thing about modules is that they keep track of prerequisites, prerequisite software. Okay, so suppose Module list, that shows me what modules I currently have loaded. Uh, by default, you will have these three modules loaded. Um, you don't even have to worry about what they are. Those are just the defaults in the, in the environment. If I say, suppose I'm interested in a program called Max. I say module avail Max. I see that I have these versions of the tool Max installed. I say module load. Max 142, and then I say module list. Before I had just three modules loaded. Now I've got seven modules loaded, even though I only asked for one. Why is that? Well, Max 142 needs other software as prerequisites. It needs Peak Splitter and Python and GCC, and it takes care of loading those prerequisites for you. So you don't even need to do that explicitly. If I module unload max, module list, I'm back to the original three. So it unloaded all of the prerequisites. If I say module load, and by the way, you can copy and paste in the, in the terminal. That's sometimes useful. Uh, if I say module load max slash 2010-2013-12-16, now I say module list. Again, I wound up with seven modules, but this time if you look closely, you'll see that I have a different version of Python. That's because the older version of Max depended on Python 2.6. The newer version depends on a newer version of Python. It takes care of all of that for you. Question? Excellent question. Right, right. So the question is, if modules are going to load their prerequisites and unload them, what if you've just loaded two modules that both depend on some module and you unload the first one? You actually can get yourself in trouble that way. Um, so the module system tries hard to keep things well structured for you, but it's not perfect. Um, and actually, I'm not sure of the particular scenario you described. It might be smart enough for that, but you can get it wedged in, with, with a complicated series of load and unload commands. You can get it in an inconsistent state. We'll see that usually where we put module commands is actually in a script, and there, there's really no need to unload modules. You just load the ones that you need. Uh, another tidbit, if you are loading and unloading, try to unload in the reverse order to kind of keep things consistent? Yes, that's, that's a, a good question. It is possible to confuse it. Okay, so I mentioned that, you're usually, that you are usually putting these module commands in scripts, and Ali mentioned in the beginning some of this information about the cluster. Here's where we really get specific to the high-performance computing facility and ours in particular. Uh, so as Ali said, we have a head node and many compute nodes. We have like 70 compute nodes. 
and we have about 500 users across the medical center. This is a shared resource, a large shared resource. If all 500 users were running everything on the head node, then the head node would be way too busy and the compute nodes would be bored because they'd have nothing to do. We need to spread out the workload. We need a batch system to, to do that. The batch system we use is called Sun Grid Engine, or SGE. And so you write scripts, as Ali showed you. And what I'm going to show you is that you submit these scripts to Sun Grid Engine, to the queuing system, where they go into a queue, and then they get run on one of the compute nodes. Sun Grid Engine handles looking for a compute node that's not too busy right now, and assigning your, your uh, job to that compute node. It runs there behind the scenes. You can check on its status. You can even log out, log back in the next day, check on its status, and you can see its output. You can get its output from files. OK, uh, basically this says what I just said. OK. Let's look at an example. So suppose you had a script that said this. This has the same format as the script Ali showed you, uh, but it has different commands in it. It says date. The date command just prints the date and the current time. It has sleep 20. The sleep command just sleeps. It just does nothing. It pauses for a given number of seconds. In that script, I have 20 seconds. I'll show you, we could say like sleep five, and it will just sit there for five seconds. Obviously, this script is not going to be particularly useful, but it's an example script. Um, sleeps for five seconds. We could say the date again. Um, this, is what is, uh, this is what these commands would do if simply run at the command prompt. Now, if I were to say, okay. Can I do nano? I'm used to another editor called Emacs, but I will try. The magic incantation that Ali gave you, pound bang slash bin slash bash, says what shell should be used to interpret this program. Oops. I need a space. Sleep space 20, because 20 is the argument to sleep. And then I say date again. Okay. And <coughs> oh. Name of file to write. We're going to call it simple.bash and then control X to exit. Let's see if I have what I expected. Cat simple.bash. Yes, I do. Okay. Whoops. All right. Just as Ali did, we are going to declare this script to be executable. In other words, we're giving ourselves permission to execute it. And then I'm going to run it. I mentioned before that there's a list of standard directories where the system looks for commands. If it's not in such a directory, you have to tell it where to find this, com this command. In this case, I'm saying in the current directory dot. So I say dot slash simple dot bash. It prints the date. In this case, I have a sleep 20 in there. So it's going to sleep for 20 seconds before coming back. And then it should print the date and time again. Ah, did you do the chmod plus x simple dot bash? Um, and you still get permission denied. Okay. That sounds like a case for one of our helpers. Okay. The threat of a helper caused it to work. Okay, now, there's something else that I put on the slide. I said... What we just did was we ran a script directly on the head node, but Ali and I have been telling you don't run stuff on the head node. Submit it to SGE. This example script is very simple. All it really does is sleep for 20 seconds. That does not consume a lot of resources. So I went ahead and did it. But in general, you're not going to be running scripts on the head node. But I wanted to show you what it would look like if we just ran it. And you'll see that what this script does is it prints two dates that are separated by 20 seconds. So this is the output that we would expect from this particular script. OK, now we're going to get to using Sun Grid Engine. So this is where we really use this, this um, system 
as a cluster, not just as a single computer. Right. So I'm going to say Q sub. All the commands for Sun Grid Engine begin with Q because you're managing a queue of jobs. So Q sub is submit to the queue. I'm going to say minus capital S that says what shell, what program should be used to interpret the script that I'm about to give it. And that shell is slash bin slash bash. I'm going to say minus CWD. That means run this script from the current working directory, the same directory in which I'm running the QSub. And then I say simple dot bash. Now, when I press enter, I'm going to run QSTAT a whole bunch of times. QSTAT is a command that says, what's the status of the queue? There are many potential flags to it. If you just run QSTAT with no flags, that means show me what jobs I have running right now. And I'm going to want to watch the status of this job as it progresses from waiting in the queue to running in the queue to finish. And this job, once it runs, will only take 20 seconds. So I'm going to either type QSTAT many, many times. Normally, you don't have to watch your job. You don't have to be crazy watching your job. You can just come back later and see if it's finished. But in this case, I want to show you what happens. I'm also going to use a command called watch. Watch says, run the following command every two seconds. I just, I'm just going to use this so, so um, we're sure to catch it. Okay. So I type this Q sub command. It tells me your job, whatever has been submitted, it tells me a job number. Your job has been submitted. I'm going to watch QSTAT. Note this QW over here, and that QW just changed to an R. QW means waiting in the queue. And R means that it's actually running, and it tells me it's running on node 62. Okay. In a good case like this, you had to look quickly to see the QW. If the cluster is really busy, your job might be waiting for a while. Now it's empty. So that says our job has finished. One way or another, it's gone. Okay. Now I'm going to show you again what it said after I did the Q sub. It just said, your job number this has been submitted. Okay. Where's my output? What I expected from that script was to print two dates separated by 20 seconds. Where did the output go? What I'm going to do is ls, and I'll see that in addition to my script, simple.bash, I now have two extra files, simple.bash.e, some number, and simple.bash.o, some number. That number is the same number of our job that we got when it was submitted. OK, the E file is where error messages typically go. In particular, what's called standard error goes there. The O file is where the output from our job goes. If I ls minus L, the long form listing, I can see the size of files, among other things. The zero there means that the file is empty. This is probably a good thing in the case of the E file because errors typically show up in the E file. So I'm glad that this is empty. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, say again? Ah, excellent question. OK, so how do you break out of the watch? Uh, oops, watch QSTAT. Control C. Control C is how you break out of the watch. Control C is interrupt in Linux, so it's how you stop a lot of things. And in particular, it's how you stop QSTAT. Okay, good question. By the way, you can also just type QSTAT without the watch, and it'll show you once what the status of your jobs is. OK, the E file is empty. That's good. The O file is non-empty. That's also good. I can say cat that O file. Ah, what's in the O file? Two dates separated by 20 seconds. That's where my output went. So the point is, whatever normally would show up on the screen if you just ran that program, instead of showing up on the screen live, it shows up in the file when the script is finished. We just ran our first job on the cluster. Oops. OK. 
That's right. Your job will still run even if you log out. Okay. By the way, did you tell them to log out when they first log in? Whenever you are finished, okay? Okay, good, good. Next question is, did anyone listen to it? When you first, whenever you log into Phoenix, or more to the point, whenever you're finished using Phoenix, log out by actually typing log out. Do that before you lose your network connection, before you shut down your uh, computer, before you put it to sleep, okay? And when you're finished for the day, yes. Uh, yes, exit, exit. If you're in a context where logout would work, exit will figure out that you meant logout. Okay. Um, now, I'm going to SSH in again. I'm going to cd to my directory. I'm going to run my same qsub command. Qstat shows it's already running. I'm going to log out. I'm going to log back in. Qstat, it's still running. Good, I caught it. So this answers Stuart's question. You can launch a job, log out of the cluster, go home, come back the next day, run Qstat. Your job may still be running or it may be finished, and then you can check on its files. Okay, so part of the point of a batch system is that it runs things in the background. You don't, you don't have to attend them. Okay, those directives that I put on the command line before, the minus capital S and the minus CWD, those can be embedded in the script itself as a couple of extra lines. So if you have options for SGE that you want to always apply to this script, you can put them in the script itself by preceding it with pound dollar sign and then the option that you would have put on the command line to queue sub. Right, so before, when I was doing the QSub before, I was putting the minus capital S bin bash and the minus CWD on the command line to QSub. Those can be embedded in the script itself. And if I embed them in the script itself, I could just say QSub simple dot bash, okay? Actually, since you said shebang, I have a feeling that your question was something else, which is how come it looks redundant? Is that what you're driving at? No, I was okay. asking whether you still need to put the shebang and then you... Yes, yes, you do. Um, so the question was... Mm -hmm. Acrobat. Yes, no? Ah, and updates available. No, not right now. Uh, so the question was, that, do you need both of these? the pound bang slash bin slash bash, sometimes affectionately known as shebang bin bash, and the minus F, capital S bin bash. Unfortunately, the answer is yes, you do. One of them tells the shell what shell to use if you're running this directly on the command line. The other one tells SGE what shell to use. As best practice, you should have them both and they should agree with each other. Um, it's annoying, but you can always copy and paste it into uh, every, every command line. Uh, sorry, every script. Okay, so uh, we looked at this. You can ls to see what files you have there. I mentioned ls minus LTR, ltr here for a reason, which is that if we cd into my Eric, you'll see that because I ran two jobs, I now have more output files here. Suppose I'm not completely sure which one was my most recent. I can say ls long form sort by time in reverse order and whatever is most recent is at the end so it's easy to see is there something new and which one is it and then I could take the something new and I could cat okay nothing in the error file I could cat the output file and see that this time again I've got two dates separated by 20 seconds but the careful observer will note that they are different times separated by 20 seconds. Okay, so we were talking about options to SGE, those things that either go on the command line to QSub or embedded in the script with the pound dollar sign. Uh, we've looked at 
minus CWD says run the script in the same directory from which I'm doing the QSub. If you're in a subdirectory, when you do the QSub, and if you're referring to files by a relative path, this can be important because without it, SGE by default runs your script from your home directory. And if that's not where you ran the QSub, this can get confusing. So I just about always use the minus CWD for current working directory. We looked at minus capital S, says which shell to use to interpret my script. Here's a couple of others we haven't looked at yet. You can optionally ask SGE to email you when your job finishes, when your job starts or finishes or crashes. Use this sparingly if you're the sort who tends to submit thousands of jobs at once because you can get thousands of emails at once. And once it gets to like tens of thousands of emails, you can really bog down the system or even cause IT to send us an email saying, hey, it looks like your HPC cluster is trying to spam the world, which means two things. One, always use your NYU email address here. It actually doesn't work if you try to send this to an external email address like Gmail. And two, use this sparingly, use your judgment about it. But if you're doing one job at a time, you can say, you can say minus capital M in your email address, your medical center email address, and you can say minus little m and flags about when you want to be mailed. A for abort, which is if your job actually crashes, B for begin when your job starts, and E for end when your job finishes normally. And you can do any combination of those, like AE. So minus little m AE means if my job aborts or finishes. There are many other SGE directives as well, but these are, these are some interesting ones. Some QSub commands. We saw QSub. We saw QSTAT tells you what jobs am I running right now. QSTAT, I'm not running anything now. If I say QSTAT minus F, I believe that's full listing, I can see the state of every node on the cluster. And you can see that each of our nodes has 32 cores or 32 slots for SGE. And on node 56, 27 of them are occupied right now, 27 out of 32. So you can see how busy the cluster is right now. Uh, <clears throat> you can also see who's running what. I can say qstat minus u for user star. And this is all the users running jobs right now. People have lots of jobs waiting. You can limit that to jobs that are actually running, minus SR for state running. And these are the jobs that are running like right now. So if you're wondering how busy is the cluster, you can find out. QSTAT. Um, QAccount. QSTAT only knows about jobs that are running. If you ask for a job you've already run, if I said QSTAT, if I have a job that's running, I could say QSTAT minus J, a particular job number. But if that job has already completed, it won't know about that job number. Claims it doesn't exist. Had that job been running right now, it would tell me about that job. But even after it's finished, I can say QAccount minus J, that job number. It takes a while to look it up because many jobs have run on our system and it's working its way through the list of all the jobs that have run on our system. But eventually, it will find your job, and it will tell you how, many res how much uh, memory your job used, things like that. It tells you when it was submitted, when it started, when it ended. Some things I always recommend to look for are failed and exit status. If everything worked well, those will both be zero. If they're non-zero, something happened to your job. It gives you all sorts of information about your job in the past. So QSTAT for current jobs. Q account for historical jobs, jobs that have already completed. QDEL deletes a job. You can QDEL a particular job number. So if I say Q sub something, I say Q stat, and it turns out I don't even want that job anymore. I can say QDEL that job, and I've deleted it. It's not there. So if you launch a job, and then we tell you you're using way too many resources, stop that. Or if you just launch a job and you realize that wasn't the job you meant at all and you just want to kill it, QDEL will do that. Okay. QLogging. 
sometimes you have something very simple that you want to try out and like you're not sure if you have the right flags for bed tools, if these flags even work at all, if it even recognizes those flags. You have something very short that you want to try out before you build a script for it. QLogin is appropriate in that situation. It gives you an interactive shell on one of our compute nodes. If you say QLogin, it says, okay, I'm scheduling your session. And now you'll note that instead of user at Phoenix1, it's username at node43 in this case. Was it found a node, node43, that wasn't too busy? It gave me an interactive session there. And I can do things like ls. I could run module commands. Module load bid tools to 15.0, for instance. And you could say bed tools version. You could do some really simple bed tools command of the type that you expect to finish while you're still sitting here. If it gets to the point that something is taking long enough that you want to get up from your computer and walk away, stop it with control C, log out of the Q login and use Q sub instead. Whenever you're finished with a Q login, it is important to log out of that Q login till you're back at Phoenix. And as I mentioned before, when you're finished for the day, you want to log out of Phoenix as well. But my point about logging out of Q login, say I have Q logged in and I'm at node 30. If I say Q stat, you'll see that I have a job running. My job that's running is the Q login job and I'm consuming one slot. That's one slot that nobody else can use right now. So that's why it's important to log out of your Q login as soon as you're finished with it. And that's also why it's important that, that QLogin is just for short stuff. For anything medium to long, use QSub. Okay, here's where we bring modules and SGE scripts together. Where modules are actually most useful is inside of scripts that you submit to SGE. So here's an example script. It's got that preamble we've used before, mentioning bin bash twice the minus CWD for running the current directory. Then I've got at least four commands in this, I mean, in this particular script, I've got four commands and some dot, dot, dots. A couple of module load commands. I'm loading a particular version of SAM tools and I'm loading a particular version of BWA. If you module load just BWA without specifying a version, you will get whatever the default is on our system. That's typically the most recent version. However, I recommend, especially in scripts, that you always specify slash the version number that you want to actually use. There are at least two reasons for this. One is that this way you've got documentation built into the script. Anyone looking at the script knows what version you used, including you if you don't remember what version you used. That's in there. The second reason is, suppose you just use the default version and later on we install a new version of BWA and that newer one becomes the default. If you were just using the default one in your script, the next time you run your script, suddenly your script might behave differently or even not work at all. And you wouldn't know why, because you didn't change the script. Whereas if you always specify the version number, you're guaranteed you're always getting that version. Your script will always behave the same way unless and until you change it and specify a different version number. So that's why I always recommend saying the, the explicit version number. Having loaded those modules, you could have additional commands in your script that actually use those tools, in this case, SAM tools and BWA. This script also shows you that you can have multiple, you can load as many modules as you want in a script, and you can have multiple commands in a script. No need to just have one in a script. Okay. Somewhat advanced topic here, but Stuart is going to use it tomorrow, and it's an interesting um, gotcha with using SGE, so I want to make sure that I cover it. Parallelism is a way of doing more than one thing at once. A particular type of parallelism is using multiple cores, multiple processors, on one node of the cluster. There are many programs these days, not all, but many programs are designed such that they can use multiple cores. In fact, a lot of RNA-seq programs 
can use multiple cores. The thing about Sun Grid Engine is that unless you tell it otherwise, it assumes that your job will use exactly one core, and it reserves that for you. We were looking at QStat minus F before to see how busy each node was, and it said how many slots were occupied. SGE can keep putting jobs on a node until it says, okay, I've filled up all of its 32 slots. It assumes that that means it's got 32 cores occupied. If one of your jobs was actually using 10 cores and there were another 31 jobs on there, then you're actually using 41 cores. The node gets too busy, it gets overloaded. Your job is running too slowly and other people's jobs are running too slowly. So you have to tell SGE how many threads you intend to use. The way you do that is with a parallel environment. SunGrid Engine has parallel environments. We have several installed on our system. The one I'm going to tell you about is called the threaded parallel environment. And so if you're going to run a program that uses multiple threads, you need to use the threaded parallel environment. The way you do that is altering your QSub command line. And again, you could put these flags in the script itself if you want. You specify a parallel environment with minus PE. Minus PE, then you tell it which parallel environment, in this case threaded. And for a parallel environment, you also have to tell it how many you want to use. For a threaded parallel environment, that means how many threads or how many cores you want to use. Question? Ah, okay. That has to correspond to, the question was, how do you know how many threads you're going to use? Okay. It has to correspond to what your script is doing. Usually how many, usually it's a question of how many you want to use. That's a user decision. And it's done in conjunction with reading the manual of the, the software. It may have guidelines about if you're doing this type of problem, we recommend you use this many cores. Okay. Um, but in general, you need to make sure that whatever the script is asking for matches up with what SGE, what you're telling SGE you're using. And this will show you how to do that. So suppose, for whatever reason, you want to use exactly four cores or four threads. I'm going to use those interchangeably for now. You would say minus PE threaded four. What that does is it tells SunGrid Engine, first of all, don't even run my job until there's a node that has at least four slots available for me on the same node. Once that's available, so your job's going to sit there in QW until that's available. Once there's a node with four slots available, SGE will start your job there, and your job then claims four slots. And so that number of slots that's busy on that node goes up by four. Also, if you're somewhat flexible about how many threads you want to use, for example, you would like to use 13, but you're not sure whether any node has 13 available, and if there's no nodes with any more than four available right now, you'd rather not wait. You'd rather just go ahead and use four. You can specify a range. You can say minus PE threaded 6 hyphen 13. That means use anywhere from 6 to 13 threads. In that case, SGE waits until there's some node that has at least six slots available on it right now. Once there's at least one such node, it finds the node with the most available on it, up to 13, and runs your job there. And it claims exactly however many slots it's using up to 13. This is good. Yeah. Ah, for, the question was, does it have to be one node or can you cross different nodes? For threads, it's got to be on one node. Okay. There's another type of parallelism. Uh, the message passing interface is an example of that MPI that can go across different nodes. We're not going to cover that today or tomorrow, but look it up in the user guide if you want to know more about it. And only certain programs support that anyway. Uh, MPI, the message passing interface, uh, that's called distributed parallelism, where you can be across multiple nodes. But threads have got to be on one node. Now, specifying a range is nice because you have some flexibility, but the problem is, how do you know how many slots you got? So how do you know how many you can use in your program? SGE tells your script when it runs how many you actually got, it tells it with a variable called n slots. So suppose you're using the program cufflinks. And suppose you look in the documentation for cufflinks that has a, a switch minus p, an option uh, minus p that says use this many threads. 
So for example, suppose the manual tells you if you want 4, say minus P4. Instead of hard coding it like that, instead of saying minus P some number, we're going to say minus P dollar n slots. Has to start with a dollar sign, it has to be all capitals n slots. Okay. If we always give that option, if we always use the variable to whatever the software wants for the number of threads to use, then we know that our program will expand to fill exactly how many slots SGE allocated to us. And therefore, therefore the load balancing works. SGE knows what's going on in that case. Different programs have different options for the number of threads, by the way. For cufflinks, it happens to be minus P. You'll see some programs have minus T for threads. Some programs have minus minus CPU equals for the number of CPUs to use. You have to read the documentation to find it out. Okay, best practices for threads. Read the documentation, that's what I was just talking about. Does the program even support threads? Do they happen by default? One gotcha is that some programs, if you don't put any option about threads, by default they grab as many as they see cores on the processor. So it kind of assumes I'm the only one running here and it grabs all 32 threads. It doesn't know that it's sharing. In that case, you have to find what option to use to tell it not to do that, instead to restrict it to just n slots threads. Um, so you, to do that, you need to know what flag controls them, and you may need to read the manual to figure out what the trade-offs are about using a large number of threads or a small number of threads in the program. And don't hard code the number of threads to an actual number, instead use n slots. Okay. I talked about n slots. I talked about the bed tools root that e or each of our each of our modules defines a variable called application name underscore root. What are these things beginning with dollar signs anyway? They're variables. Okay. A variable can be used at the shell. It can be used inside a script. They can be defined by the system. They can be defined by environment modules like this bed tools root. They can be defined by SGE, like n slots is, or you can define some yourself, and they can be useful inside scripts. So user-defined variables, you could just create a variable called name. You could say name equals Bob, and then if you echo name, you'll get Bob. Oops. Echo dollar name. Okay, the dollar means the value of that. Echo name. Echo name. I can change the value and print the new value. Okay, so I can set my own variables. Okay. Why would this be useful? Well, inside a script, what if you had to refer to some really long directory path and then use that in multiple places in your script? So you could set a variable so you only have to mention that path once and then use it in multiple places. It helps to make it easier to read. It helps to make it easier to write. So you could say dir for directory, you could say dir equals some really long path. Then you could say make directory dir and then copy file.txt into dir. I'm using it twice. It has the same value both times. Okay. What about arguments? This is something that can be very useful for making your scripts flexible. Suppose you don't know what dir is going to be in advance. You want a script that's flexible enough that you can tell it a different directory each time you run it. You could say dir equals dollar one. Dollar one means the first argument that got passed to the script, the first thing that shows up on the command line after the name of the command. So I could say dir equals dollar one, make directory dir copy file.txt into dollar dir, and then what I have up top is the contents of the script. What I have down below is how you would qsub it. You could say qsub some script slash some really long path. That slash some really long path is going to become the value of $1 and hence the value of dir, which means later on I could qsub it with some other value for that. So you can reuse the same script for multiple purposes, multiple times. It's really useful. Uh, since with SGE you need a script for everything, 
it's useful to have one script that you can use for your workflow, even if you're giving it different files and directories. You can have multiple arguments in a script. $1 means the first one, $2 means the second one. So I could have one for the directory and one for the file. I can say qsub, name of script, first argument, second argument. Those get substituted in for $1 and $2 respectively. Okay, I have some exercises. I don't know that we're going to have time for the exercises, but hopefully we will. Just before we start the exercises, I want to give you some closing stuff for further reading here. We were um, challenged here because we have limited time to tell you HPC on one day and RNA-seq the next day, just two hours each. We have some other stuff that we've written up that goes in more detail, more depth. We have a user guide, which I highly recommend. I'm biased. We wrote the user guide, all three of us, but I like it. Um, that's the URL for the user guide. Um, this is what it looks like in hard copy, uh, but there's PDF on um, the web page. goes into all sorts of detail. Can you email this? Yes. Yeah, we will send you that link, uh, and we'll also send you a link to where the slides are. Okay. User Guide has lots of useful information, including about another editor called Emacs, including about file permissions, um, including how to tell SGE how much memory you intend to use, how much RAM, all sorts of good stuff in the User Guide. We've also given other tutorials before where we had the luxury of more time, so we covered more stuff. If you go to MedNYUEDU slash Chibi, as in Center for Health Informatics and Bioinformatics, slash education slash tutorials. Yes, we'll send you that. We have two tutorials on Linux there. They're both called Linux for Cluster Computing something. There's Linux for Cluster Computing, then there's second tutorial on Linux for Cluster Computing. So if you look at that, lots of good stuff there. Other people have done tutorials on Linux, including this nice one from Cornell. There is an excellent book on Unix, which Linux is essentially a flavor of Unix, uh, The Unix Programming Environment by Kernahan and Pike. This book is about as old as I am. It's an oldie but a goodie. And it covers the whole thing with exercises. Good stuff in here. Um, you can always ask us. There's our email address, hpc underscore admins at nyumc. Dot org. Um, and Ali pointed out that if it's a, about a problem, show us what you type and the error messages that came out and where you were when you typed it. Okay. okay, so I do, and I've given you no time for them, um, but I did have some exercises here, uh, which uh, you could try out if you have time and if you want to, or we're going to send you these anyway. You could do them offline and ask them about us, ask us about them. Um, also, Lauren is here, so if there are Windows people who want to know how to use uh, uh, WinSCP, you can do that. I have a question. Right, so the, the question is about charges for using the the Chibi High Performance Computing Facility. Right, so mainly we charge for disk space. Um, and well, also for large amounts of computing. So a standard account is free. Um, for that, you can use two core years per year, which means if you kept two cores busy nonstop, um, 365 days a year, 24 hours a day. Um, and as Ali mentioned, in terms of disk space, you get a quota of 200 gigabytes on your directory. That comes free. If you need more disk space, then first, you should be considering a shared directory for a lab or a project, which we can set up under IFS data and set up a group that has access to that. And then we charge for quota $50 per terabyte per month. That works out to $600 per terabyte per year for a quota. And warning, since this is the RNA-seq tutorial, if you're doing anything involved with sequencing, storage can pile up quickly. Um, other applications tend to be a lot less storage, but tend to be more compute heavy. So it all depends. But 
The good news is you've got enough to get your feet wet on the cluster without paying anything. Uh, Ah, so we can handle these. yes, Lauren has surveys. Yeah, essentially uh -huh. we want to know how well we did. Mm -hmm. um, and in particular, if there's anything we didn't cover sufficiently to prepare you for tomorrow. So mm -hmm. if you get a chance to fill in these feedback forms, and there's also this smart button and that's just in case it's not. Um, and if you get a chance, leave them with us so we can adapt tomorrow. Well, if you don't get a chance, to just uh, bring them back tomorrow. And if there are any questions about WinSCP, we have a few minutes to discuss mm -hmm. them too. I could do a live demo if that's what people would like. One person? Yeah, I Okay. So this will look a little bit different from your machine because it's this room PC, but I think we should get the gist across. Normally when you install WinSCP on a Windows machine, you would use the installer. I can't install on this MCIT controlled machine, so I'm using what's called the portable version, which you can just execute. And it looks, I should probably make it more pristine. Okay, this is what it would look like if you first started it. And to log in to Phoenix and transfer files, you need to give your username. I'm using demo here, but this would be your Kerberos ID or username. At phoenix.match.nyu.edu. And then the most important part is hidden under the advanced button here. So click advanced, go to authentication, and click here to select your private key file. Now, I have this here on this USB stick. You probably have it in your Windows Documents folder somewhere. So select this private key that you previously generated with PuttyGen. It's the same one that you're using for Putty. Click OK here. And it's convenient to save what is called a session in um, WinSCP, so you don't have to configure this every time. So click Save, and you can just accept the defaults here. And now you can click Log In. Um, on an even more pristine system than this one, it would ask you to confirm the host keys, which you can find in our user guide. So check that the host keys the system presents is right. And then type the passphrase for your private key. 